Hello, and welcome back. All right, in this video, we're finally gonna get to the good stuff. What is it that complement actually does to fight infection? Uh, so here we're gonna discuss the effector mechanisms of uh, all of the different complement pathways. So to this point, uh, we've said numerous times that all of the complement uh, protein, or the all the complement pathways converge on the formation of a C3 convertase, and uh, C3 convertase forms C3A and C3B, and C3 B in particular is important for initiating many of uh, the effector mechanisms of complement that kill pathogens. Um, but C3B is not the only thing, as we'll see. But uh, the combination of C3A and C3B uh, promote a number of downstream outcomes. They include inflammation or the recruitment of immune cells into tissue, phagocytosis, cellular eating, as well as the formation of the membrane attack complex. So we'll get into each of these. Let's refresh our memory a little bit on the molecules involved here. So here we have uh, the classical complement cascade, starting with C1 bound to antibody. Um, in the context of the classical cascade or the lectin cascade, um, we're going to form a C3 convertase, which is composed of C4B and C2A. That's going to recruit C3 and proteolytically cleave it into C3A, which floats away or C3B, which can either go on to coat other pathogens uh, and serve as an opsonin, or stay on the original target cell and complex with the C3 convertase. And when C3B binds to the C3 convertase, in this case we have C4B to A3B, that makes a C5 convertase. And so uh, the C5 convertase activity uh, is important for recruiting more molecules of complement that we haven't discussed yet. Uh, but this is kind of a branch point where each of the effector mechanisms originates. So C3A is really important for promoting inflammation, that first effector mechanism, well, whereas C3B binding to pathogens can serve as an opsonin, which promotes phagocytosis. And the formation of a C5 convertase is most important for forming the membrane attack complex. So let's look at this again using the figure from your textbook, because now this brings in uh, the alternative pathway, which can also initiate all of these effector mechanisms. So uh, C3B binding to uh, either of the C3 convertases, so C4B to A, which is the classical uh, C3 convertase, or C3B VB, which is the alternative C3 convertase, binding of C3B to a C3 convertase, both forms a C5 convertase. So the C5 convertase of the classical pathway is shown here, uh, which is just 3B attached to the original uh, C3 convertase, or in the context of the alternative pathway, the C3 convertase of the alternative pathway, remember, was one molecule of C3B bound to BB, um, but when an additional copy of C3B binds to that, we get a molecule called C3B2, meaning two copies of C3B, C3B2BB. Um, I know, I'm struggling a little bit here, I'm sure you are too, um, but the, the important thing is that uh, when C3B binds to the C3 convertase, it forms an enzyme called a C5 convertase. And you should by now be able to predict what a C5 convertase is going to do. Uh, the C5 convertase is going to bind to C5 and proteolytically cleave it. Uh, C5A, the smaller fragment, is going to float away, and C5B is going to stick around and bind to downstream substrates. So let's talk about what happens uh, particularly with uh, C5B. So uh, we're going to go back to the classical pathway now, just for illustration purposes. We have our C5 convertase from the classical pathway, so the C3 convertase bound to C3B. That's going to recruit C5. C5A is going to float away after being prote proteolytically cleaved. Uh, C5B is going to stick around, and when we form C5B, C it, it then goes on to recruit more uh, complement molecules. So, uh, in, in fortunately, in this case, the numbers all go in order. So C5B recruits C6 and C7. Uh, C7 recruits C8, which anchors this complex to the plasma membrane of the target cell. And then C8 is going to recruit a molecule called C9, and not just one molecule of C9, but actually many, and they actually form this oligomeric pore structure, which makes up the membrane attack complex. So um, all of these molecules, C5B, 6, 7, 8, and 9, form the membrane attack complex, or MAC, M-A-C.
So uh, let's go back to your textbook figure just to kind of look at this again. C5b, as I said, binds C6 and C7, and that's kind of floating around for now. Uh, but when C7 recruit or when C7 is recruited into the complex, it attaches to the plasma membrane. Um, C7 is going to recruit CH, which inserts itself and kind of anchors to the membrane. Uh, and then C8 is going to recruit uh, multiple copies of C9. And C9 polymerizes to begin to form this round pore structure. Um, and in fact, 10 to 16 molecules of C9 ultimately come together uh, to form, uh, it kind of looks like one of those pipes from Mario, uh, same idea, uh, right? The things, uh, water now from the outside of the cell is going to be able to flow into the inside of the cell, ultimately causing its lysis. And these pores are very obvious under the microscope. Uh, this is electron microscopy. You can see that this bacterium is full of holes uh, that have been initiated by the membrane attack complex. So this is a very effective mechanism of killing bacteria and infected cells in our bodies. So this is membrane attack. This is one of the effector mechanisms of complement. Uh, let's go back and talk about uh, those other two. So uh, inflammation, as I've said many times, is the recruitment of immune cells to sites of infection or sites of injury for that matter. And in the context of, in, of, of complement, inflammation is really driven by complement molecules that we call anaphylatoxins. Anaphylatoxins get their name from their ability to induce anaphylactic shock. You may have heard of that. Um, uh, the point is that they're very good at inducing inflammatory responses. Uh, so the anaphylatoxins uh, that we'll focus on are C3A and C5A. Uh, it's a little easy uh, to associate the A um, molecules with, with inflammation because anaphylatoxin starts with A, if that helps. Um, but C3A and C5A, I keep saying they float away. Well, they float away and they actually bind to receptors on the surface of other cells. So the receptor for C3A is the C3A receptor, C3AR, or there's a C5A receptor, not surprisingly. And what I want to point out here is that uh, anaphylatoxin receptors are G-protein coupled receptors. And uh, you don't need to worry about all the molecular biology of G-proteins for this class. Uh, but if you've taken another class where you've seen them before, you may remember that uh, G-protein coupled receptors can induce lots of complicated downstream signals uh, through second messenger cascades. Uh, and they really influence the morphology and the gene expression of cells in, in profound ways. And so uh, when uh, anaphylatoxin receptors on the surface of immune cells are activated, it does a lot of things that promote the processes of inflammation. So we can see some examples of that here. Um, anaphylatoxin receptors signaling on various immune cells that we've encountered before uh, initiates a lot of their effector functions. So when anaphylatoxins signal to macrophages, it induces the process of chemotaxis or their movement uh, through the body, uh, as well as their production of chemical messengers called cytokines, as well as stimulating them to phagocytose things. So we can turn on phagocytosis by macrophages with anaphylatoxins. Um, one thing here uh, that you may see, we haven't talked about them in a while, is uh, all of these granulocytes. So remember that there was a family of uh, myeloid cells that we said had all of these little granules in their cytoplasms, neutrophils, basophils, and so on. Uh, well, this is a case where those granules become relevant to the immune response. Uh, binding of anaphylatoxins like C3A and C5A uh, to the surface of granulocytes causes them to release these granules into the extracellular space. Uh, and these granules are full of all sorts of effector proteins like cytotoxic proteins which, kills, which kill their target cells um, and other proteins which regulate uh, other immune cells like T cells. But this process by which a granulocyte becomes activated and releases its granules is called degranulation. So a major outcome of anaphylatoxin signaling is the degranulation of granulocytes. Um, so you can see that you know for neutrophils, uh, they're going to kill cells uh, really early in infection. Uh, for cells like basophils and mast cells, remember their granules contain histamine. Uh, in this case, uh, releasing of their granules is going to uh, cause allergic responses. And so uh, anaphylatoxin signaling can do a lot of different things, um, all of which conspire to control infection in one way or another. So aside from direct activation of cells, another important thing that anaphylatoxins do is actually regulate the blood vessels themselves um, and induce a process called vasodilation or swelling or relax, relaxation of the walls of the blood vessels. Um, and when they do this, they induce an increase in vascular permeability.
So you can see here, uh, we've got C th C3A and C5A. Um, they're, they're binding to the, the endothelial cells that make up the wall of the blood vessel. And normally, immune cells and effector proteins like complement and antibodies, they're circulating in the blood. We don't normally have a lot of them in our tissues. And that's a good thing because we don't want them there unless they're needed. Um, but if we have an infection and we begin to produce anaphylatoxins downstream of complement activation, the blood vessel actually begins to swell. And when it does so, um, it allows fluid to leak from the blood into the tissue. So now we have these open spaces or fenestrations between the endothelial cells of the blood vessel. And when this happens, that allows things to leak uh, into the tissue, things like uh, molecules of the complement cascade, as well as any antibodies that are circulating in the blood. So this really gives access to the tissue in ways that, that we don't normally see under homeostasis so that complement and antibodies can find the things that they're targeted against uh, and, and actually uh, exert their functions on them and, and control the infection. Um, besides these, these you know, sort of circulating molecules like complement and antibody, vasodilation also allows the extravasation or the, uh, the movement out of the blood vessel, that's what extravasation is, of immune cells like macrophages, granulocytes, and lymphocytes. And in particular, this allows activated effector lymphocytes like CD8 T cells, which have seen their antigen in the lymph node or the spleen, uh, so to actually migrate to the site of infection in the tissue, escape the blood vessel, and find its antigen in the tissue itself. So this process of vasodilation is actually a very, very important part of inflammation and is one of the major ways that anaphylatoxins uh, promote the inflammatory effector function of complement. Okay, that's inflammation. Let's talk about the last effector function of complement, uh, which is uh, opsonization, which of course promotes phagocytosis. So uh, we've begun to be introduced to various receptors which sense complement proteins. Um, another one that's important is CR1. CR1 is a receptor for C3B. So C3B can coat the surface of bacteria and other pathogens in a way that opsonizes them, which means it makes them uh, yummier for macrophages and other phagocytes to eat. Uh, this happens because C3B kind of docks to CR1 on the surface of the macrophage and sort of holds them in close proximity so that the macrophage uh, has, has them ready to eat. However, this binding is not sufficient by itself to induce phagocytosis. We also need a second signal in the form of C5A binding to its receptor on the surface of the same cell. And when C5A and C3B bind to the surface of the macrophage, that double signal is enough to induce uh, the ingestion uh, of the bacterium or whatever it is into the lysosome. Uh, and ultimately to be broken down. So in this way, C3B sort of collaborates with the anaphylatoxins uh, in order to induce phagocytosis of, of bacteria. Um, getting rid of bacteria is not the only function of the opsonization uh, possibilities from C3B. In fact, C3B can also opsonize antibodies. So why do we need to opsonize antibodies? Well, remember that antibodies can take up soluble antigen and bind them in these complicated uh, macromolecular complexes called immune complexes. So this is good because it prevents those antigens from binding to their receptors or from you know, causing other damage in the body. But now we kind of just have these big globs of antigen and antibodies, and these, these are also not good. We don't want these. So how do we get rid of them? Well, C3B actually can bind to the antibody in a different place from its antigen binding region. So antibodies have these Y shapes that we'll talk about later in the course, uh, the, the sort of arms of the Y bind the antigens, but the stalk is available to bind other things. And so C3B is, avail is one of the things that the stalk of the antibody binds. When C3B binds to the stalk of the antibody, that allows it to associate with the receptor CR1. Remember, CR1 is a C3B receptor. And as it turns out, red blood cells have CR1 on their surface, um, and the CR1 binds to any C3B that it sees, and these red blood cells then sort of drag the immune complexes along with them. They're sort of hanging on by that C3B-CR1 interaction. And the red blood cells themselves don't do much with those immune complexes, but they do take them back to the spleen and the liver, uh, which are full of phagocytes like macrophages. And CR1 on the surface of those phagocytes kind of snatches the immune complex away from the red blood cell, 
and uh, allows it to be internalized. And so phagocytes then clear the immune complexes in tissues like the spleen and the liver. Uh, but the red blood cells are important because they're all over the body. And whenever they come across these uh, immune complexes coated with C3B, uh, they sort of take them and, and then transport them back to the, to the organs, the liver and the spleen so that they can be taken care of. Okay, we, we blew through those effector mechanisms of complement. So let's summarize the things that, that the complement system does. Uh, we started by saying that C3B initiates uh, most of the important complement effector functions. Uh, it does so uh, primarily, or not primarily, in, in one case by uh, forming a common component of C5 convertases. So uh, we had two different C5 convertases, but ultimately uh, the formation of C5 convertase went on to promote the formation of the membrane attack complex. Uh, but besides that, a downstream function of C3B uh, is to serve as an obstinate. It can coat either bacteria, pathogens, as well as antibodies and target them for phagocytosis. The C5 convertase, which is downstream of C3B, uh, as I said, is important for creating the membrane attack complex, or MAC. Uh, C5B recruits C6, 7, 8, and 9 in sequence, and polymers of C9 form pores in membranes, uh, which disturb their membrane integrity, ultimately resulting in their death. Complement cleavage products uh, like C3A and C5A uh, serve as what we call anaphylatoxins, really potent inflammatory signaling molecules. Uh, so they induce immunological signaling downstream of deprotein coupled receptors, and these receptors promote many different inflammatory processes like activating granulocytes, inducing vasodilation, etc. Finally, complement proteins promote phagocytosis as they're in, their, in their capacity as opsonins. So C3B and C5A work in complex uh, to mediate CR1-mediated phagocytosis of pathogens, and uh, C3B can also target immune complexes for clearance by opsonizing antibodies. Uh, so lots of cool things that complement does. At this point, uh, we're finished with complement. You've made it to the other side. It will come up again in the course. Um, but at this point, I would really recommend that you read the textbook uh, sections in chapter two related to complement. We've introduced a lot of molecules, talked about a lot of complicated biology. Uh, the textbook will be a, a good resource for you as you study and solidify these concepts for yourself. Uh, but in terms of our lectures, we're going to move on from complement now and talk about some additional early responses of the innate immune system. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to focus on two of them. Uh, those include phagocytosis as well as programmed cell death. Thanks.